A very good morning to respected faculty. I am honored to welcome Dr. Mamta Bhatt, ma'am, MD, MSc, PhD, FRCPC, currently Associate Professor of Medicine, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at University of Toronto. Dr. Mamta Bhatt, ma'am, has very vast experience of study in the field of microbiology and immunology, medicine, family medicine, internal medicine, and gastroenterology. She has been clinical investigator program, FRCPC. She has achieved various honors of experimental medicine, transplant hepatology fellow, PhD in medical biophysics. She has contributions to medical science in the form of 22 publications and ongoing research in many projects. She has special interest in application of artificial intelligence in liver transplant recipients. Ma'am is doing research program dedicated to improving the long-term survival of liver transplant recipients using machine learning and bioinformatic tools. I request ma'am to present the lecture. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction and uh, it's a real pleasure for me to uh, be here at uh, the Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences. Uh, I'm very impressed with uh, uh, this beautiful building that uh, Dr. Sarin uh, has established uh, with the support of so many uh, colleagues here. So really a vibrant uh, clinical and research program. So really uh, wonderful to be here and, uh, you know, share uh, some of the experience that my group has had in uh, developing tools of artificial intelligence and actually deploying those tools uh, into the clinical setting. And I think there's a lot of opportunity as well for collaborations uh, in this regard. So these are my disclosures. Um, I'll start off by discussing uh, why uh, machine learning in liver disease and transplantation. I'll really be focusing on some applications in liver transplantation, including predicting dynamic trajectories on the wait list, uh, optimizing post-transplant patient survival, and optimizing graft survival in liver transplant recipients. And so I, I think that um, you will all uh, appreciate, you know, how much we deal with patterns in data as hepatologists. So uh, really the inspiration uh, for my starting to work with AI came around seven years ago. So I was just, you know, completing my PhD. I completed my PhD at the end of 2018, but I was starting to hear about uh, the applications of artificial intelligence in skin cancer and uh, in diabetic retinopathy recognition. So using imaging data to uh, diagnose these, uh, um, you know, specific conditions. And uh, these were published in JAMA that year, in 2017, around that time. And so um, it really inspired me to then look into uh, applications of artificial intelligence in hepatology, because I recognized that as a hepatologist, I was constantly working with lots of data, looking at patterns in data. But the reality is that the human brain can only really account for four variables at a time, including longitudinal changes in those variables. So you may realize, you know, when you see a given patient in front of you, you will be considering, uh, wanting to consider several variables in that patient and longitudinal changes, meaning the history of those changes over time, their clinical history. So all of these parameters uh, need to be considered to generate a personalized prediction for that given patient in front of you. Now, the reality is that we as hepatologists, we are trying to subconsciously integrate these data to uh, generate these personalized predictions, but we are unable to, you know, truly uh, take into account the really the tens or hundreds of variables that really have an impact ultimately on uh, a given patient's uh, diagnosis and prognosis. So if you look at our day-to-day -day practice, we have so many different factors that will affect uh, the, the liver pathology and outcomes. Uh, there are complex nonlinear patterns in liver enzymes. So we're constantly looking at patterns in liver enzymes, patterns in liver function tests. Uh, as well as other tests. And there's all sorts of different data types that are being generated uh, in our liver practice and in research. And so, you know, this is what really made me 
interested, inspired me in looking into the application of artificial intelligence in liver disease and transplantation. And these are some of the reviews from my group um, summarizing the literature uh, in uh, machine learning as it pertains to liver disease and transplantation. Uh, this is from a review that we published last year in Journal of Hepatology uh, looking at the applications of machine learning in liver transplantation specifically. And uh, again, in transplantation, you can think of different types or themes of, uh, you know, areas where uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning tools could have applications. And so identifying suitable donor organs, weightless prioritization, applications in donor recipient matchmaking, as well as prediction of out outcomes. And additionally, there is this ability to look at longitudinal trajectories or dynamics. So if you think about data that you're looking at in a data, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, like acute on chronic liver failure, clearly there are dynamics in that data. And you're wanting to take those dynamics into account as well to appreciate how a given patient will uh, progress or, uh, you know, what their outcomes will be over time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, looking at optimizing survival in liver transplant recipients, there are different applications there as well. So uh, I think, you know, with machine learning and artificial intelligence tools, there's a lot of potential to really bring together all of these data points and bring together, distill that complexity into uh, predictions that can be personalized for a given patient. So I'm kind of, I'm skimming over a bit of the AI part of uh, things. Uh, I think many are somewhat aware of uh, what artificial intelligence is and machine learning is. So I didn't really delve into the basics, but what I would like to do in this talk is show you uh, what my group has done in terms of developing methods that are specifically suited for a given clinical question. So um, I've been working very closely with computer science professors at the University of Toronto to uh, generate methods that are ideally suited for a specific question, specific question. So what computer scientists are able to do is develop methods, if they understand the clinical question very well, then they are able to devise new methods, develop new methods that can suit that specific question. So they won't just use off-the-shelf machine learning methods. They will actually develop new tools that are suited to the question. And I would say that this has been, say, in my program's case, you know, it really has required a lot of learning each other's language. So my PhD was in medical biophysics, so I have some you know, coding background, so in bioinformatics as well as uh, molecular biology. Uh, but really in the last uh, six, seven years, I've had the opportunity to work very closely with computer scientists. We have regular meetings and, you know, I learn from the graduate students, the postdoctoral fellows, the computer science uh, collaborators, and they also learn from, you know, the regular discussions that we have. And they learn the clinical nuances so that they can develop the, the methods that are suited to a question. And uh, what I will often do, and you'll see this in the papers that we've published from my group, uh, I will pair a computer science trainee, say a computer science graduate student or a postdoctoral fellow, with a clinical trainee. So they are co-first authors. And then uh, the computer science uh, collaborator and myself are our co-senior authors. So we drive the project all together. And it's really, as I said, it's a question of learning each other's language uh, so that we can have a common meeting point. And uh, I would say, you know, I will also uh, have the computer science students sometimes shadow me in the clinic so that they understand what is the reason, what is the inspiration for the question that they're studying. Because if they can understand how important, you know, the outcome of their project will be, what impact it could have on patients and, uh, you know, survival and their lives, um, I think that will particularly inspire them in their work. So I think that's very important because often computer scientists will not have that, you know, nuanced knowledge, and so that is critical. So uh, the first project I'll talk about is uh, predicting dynamic trajectories on the waitlist using machine learning. 
And so uh, in close collaboration with a computer science colleague, uh, we have developed a nonlinear dynamic model of end-stage liver disease for accurate and fair risk assessment. So the melt sodium, as you know, um, has been shown to disadvantage female patients. There is a disadvantage to patients with primary biliary cholangitis, and over time, there's been a significant shift in the underlying cohort. So whereas the MELD was developed at a time when hepatitis C was the dominant indication for transplant, so parenchymal disease, um, this over time has shifted to alcoholic liver disease and metabolic associated uh, steatotic liver disease. And so there has been a significant shift over time in the cohort. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned, cholestatic liver disease patients are disadvantaged because the bilirubin is relatively underweighted as compared to the INR and creatinine, which are uh, more heavily weighted because parenchymal liver disease uh, tends to manifest you know, in terms of severity of disease with a higher INR and creatinine. So uh, certainly over time, it has been noted that there are significant inequities in liver transplant allocation. Now, I should say that this is all in the context of a deceased donor allocation system. I realize that this isn't, you know, f fully pertinent to the context here, but it just gives you a sense of, you know, how um, you recognize these inequities and thought that uh, the development of an AI method uh, could address some of these inequities. And so we sought to address this. So um, the, this was the question we asked ourselves because we realized that in our program at the University Health Network in Toronto, that women were especially disadvantaged and that they were reliant on living donor liver transplantation. So we published that work in JAMA Surgery a few years ago, and that was really my inspiration because I was seeing this in practice. I was seeing that uh, you know, women were tending to pass away on the waiting list uh, more so than men, uh, and so they were unable to attract deceased donor organ offers uh, to the same extent. They had uh, twice less a chance of attracting a deceased donor organ offer. Uh, but, uh, you know, having the access to living donor liver transplantation at least gave them an equivalent access to transplant, but really that's not the solution. So we need to, you know, look at how we can make deceased donor organ allocation more fair uh, overall. So regardless of, uh, you know, uh, sex, indication for uh, transplant, et cetera. <clears throat> so our hypothesis was that some of the present inequities stems from inaccurate modeling. So the melt sodium is a linear functional form. Uh, and so we thought that uh, we would uh, develop an algorithm that could better reflect the dynamics. So um, machine learning is overall about learning equations from data. And so we uh, were interested in developing a deep learning method that could learn complex equations from data. And so I think you're all familiar with uh, deep learning applications uh, in terms of imaging uh, data, text to image generation, and conversational agents. And in this case, what we wanted to do was develop a deep learning method get, that could integrate the longitudinal changes and dynamics over time. So we considered over 53,000 patients listed for liver transplantation in the United States since 2016, uh, adult patients with decompensa decompensated cirrhosis and without exception points. So we excluded those patients who had been listed for hepatocellular carcinoma, hepatopulmonary syndrome, and other exception point indications. So the reason for exception points, as you're aware, is because um, there is such complexity in terms of indications for transplant, and those patients uh, cannot have their severity of disease reflected by blood tests. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we considered 24 static and time-varying features per patient. This was the average, uh, say, uh, characteristics. These were the average characteristics uh, of this data set and cohort. And then we considered... Uh, a deep learning version of the Cox proportional hazards model. So this is nonlinear survival analysis, but then added a variable at each longitudinal time point on the wait list to account for first order and second order rate of change. So velocity and acceleration in uh, the different blood test variables over time. So if you consider the INR, the bilirubin, the creatinine. 
Um, so as you know, uh, I mean, uh, all of you have so much experience with ACLF, but, uh, you know, if you consider someone who had a melsodium of 15 two weeks ago and then has had a rapid rise in their melsodium over a short period of time to 30, um, then they are going to be much sicker overall as compared to someone who has had their melsodium kind of stable at 28 to 30 over those last two weeks. So this is an important factor in terms of reflecting the severity of uh, a patient's illness. And so uh, ultimately, we were using a nonlinear neural network model on a more recent cohort of patients, including different covariates, including the uh, diagnosis, the functional status, the CITES, and then also incorporating the rate of change covariates uh, at each time point on the wait list. So there was an average of 12 time points on the wait list. So we considered all those different time points. Then we evaluated the correspondence between rank ordering by risk score and rank ordering by time of death within 90 days. And this is similar to an area under the rock curve for right censored patients. Uh, so this was the 90 day concordance index that we uh, calculated um, on uh, patients uh, who uh, were considering Dynameld as opposed to uh, Melsodium, Mel3.0 and COX-PH. And so the 90-day concordance index for melsodium and mel3.0 were 0.79 and 0.793, respectively. And then for dynameld, it was uh, 0.830. And then when we looked at a specific method, so there's this specific method called the uh, pooled group concordance, which is uh, a method that was developed and published last summer uh, that looks at the fairness of uh, a particular algorithm. So um, it's, it's um, a measure of concordance over pairs where the first member is part of a defined protected group. So for example, women or patients with primary biliary cholangitis who are significantly disadvantaged on the wait list. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we considered the fairness on the held out validation data, uh, in fact, our algorithm performed much better overall for women as well as those with primary biliary cholangitis with uh, a pooled group concordance index of 0.84 and 0.905 respectively. And then if we look at individualizing prediction of trajectories, so um, when we looked at, say, a female patient with MASH cirrhosis, female patient with PBC, a patient with acute on chronic liver failure, Dynameld would have better reflected the dynamics on the wait list as compared to uh, the melt sodium. Now, the, what we are able to do as well is actually interpret why it is that a given patient has a certain trajectory, anticipated trajectory. So um, what we did was something called Shapley analysis, which you might be familiar with, but it gives you a certain interpretability to a prediction uh, made by an ML algorithm, a machine learning algorithm. So with this Shapley analysis, you can determine what are the top predictors of outcome for an overall cohort, but then for any new patient coming forward, or even you know for any patient within that cohort, you can determine what are the top predictors of outcome for that individual patient. So why is it that that patient has a higher risk of dropout or death on the wait list? So very interestingly and reassuringly, uh, serum, bilirubin, creatinine, INR, albumin, and sodium were actually the top predictors for the overall population. However, if you look at, uh, so there are several patients who actually um, have significant importance. Uh, when you look at the first order change in patient bilirubin, this is an important uh, feature for several patients, uh, as is the first order change in patient INR, serum sodium, and serum creatinine. And then you have a number of other features, including history of encephalopathy and other, um, you know, a list of other features, the, the um, you know, the um, uh, history of type 2 diabetes, uh, et cetera. So all of these features do have some importance for at least some people, some patients in that cohort. So I think it's very important to consider that, you know, in the end, the message is that one size doesn't fit all. So we really have to be mindful that, you know, uh, a very simple linear functional formula may not be the best way to serve 
uh, such a complex patient population. And so this is where machine learning algorithms provide the opportunity to model that complexity, to understand that complexity, and help us uh, serve our patients much more equitably and uh, fairly. So the limitations of this work, and next up, so this is work that has been funded by uh, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, which is the equivalent of the NIH, the National Institutes of uh, Health in the U.S. So uh, we recently received a, a five-year grant uh, from the CIHR to support this work and uh, actually uh, perform external validation at the other centers across the country. Uh, and we're also uh, wanting to collaborate with other centers, including in the U.S. and uh, perhaps uh, other countries, uh, uh, you know, to, to further validate this model and assess, you know, how this model would perform in other contexts. And then actually when you do that, you can determine, say, for example, this model doesn't work as well in uh, India. So, for example, if we were to test uh, this model at the ILBS, uh, you could then uh, say, okay, well, the PGCI, the concordance index, isn't as high as it was with the uh, U.S. data. Why is that? So you can actually identify what are the reasons, the environmental factors or the features, what are the features that are playing an important role as to why this algorithm is not performing as well at ILBS as compared to the U.S.? And then you can actually refine that model and, you know, train that model to say, okay, this is where, you know, what, what we need to do to fine tune this model so that it can best serve the patients at ILBS or best serve the patients in Germany or some other country, you know, so we can actually, um, identify, and this is feasible because, uh, you know, computer scientists are uh, well able to do this. Identify what are the reasons why an algorithm performs well in one context versus another, and then change that, you know, train that model such that it can better perform here as opposed to there. So limitations of this work, computationally costly to train large neural networks. This approach only tackles demand side inequity, doesn't tackle the supply side inequities. So organ, uh, uh, attracting an organ offer. Uh, so next steps are external validation and incorporating patients with exception points. So next I'll talk to you about some published work from my group. We published uh, some work in Lancet Digital Health in the last few years. And so uh, these are algorithms that we're actually deploying into uh, the clinical setting and actually evaluating how these are working prospectively, how accurate these are prospectively. So uh, the first uh, case I'll discuss with you is optimizing post-transplant patient survival. And so this was a paper we published in Lancet Digital Health in 2021. It was in close collaboration with Bo Wang, who is a chief AI scientist at the University Health Network. And uh, it was driven by a computer science trainee, an undergraduate student, and uh, a clinical research fellow on my team, so Oswald and Amir, who collaborated very closely together to drive this project to completion. And so the idea here was um, predicting survival due to long-term complications after liver transplantation. So we wanted to be able to risk stratify individual patients uh, using deep machine learning algorithms uh, trained on longitudinal data. So why? what was the inspiration for this? So uh, in liver transplant practice, so I, I have a practice of uh, 350 liver transplant recipients, and we as a program overall follow about 2,500 liver transplant recipients very closely. So we follow them, uh, you know, in the longer term, we follow them on an annual basis. And so when we see patients in clinic, um, you know, it's very simple to say, okay, your liver enzymes are fine, and then, you know, uh, you can go back to your family doctor. And But the reality is that our patients overall, and this is true worldwide, liver transplant recipients actually, um, you know, don't have a great average life expectancy as compared to the general population. In fact, um, you know, our data suggests that uh, they live 20 years less than the average life expectancy uh, in Canada. So uh, what can we do really to change this and turn transplant into a cure? The reality is that the long-term survival is compromised by a heightened incidence of cancer. So obviously when patients are on immunosuppression, you're suppressing the cancer sensing mechanism of the immune system. So they're unable to, so uh, I'm sure many, many of you are aware of this, but you know, 
patients who uh, have received a transplant have a much higher risk of cancer. So any abnormal cells are not recognized by the immune system as effectively. They also have a higher risk of cardiometabolic disease. In fact, liver transplant recipients have a two to three times higher incidence of cardiovascular mortality in the first 10 years after liver transplantation as compared to an age and sex matched general population. So uh, this is because calcineurin inhibitors, which we use as the standard immunosuppressants uh, in the long-term post-transplant, uh, actually uh, induce beta cell apoptosis, uh, so pancreatic beta cell apoptosis, you have less uh, insulin secretion. And then also over time, you know, when patients gain weight, et cetera, over time, then you have also insulin resistance. So they have a higher risk of diabetes, which then, uh, and then also hypertension and dyslipidemia, obviously then cardiovascular mortality is going to be much higher as well as infection. So all of these are important reasons for compromised long-term survival. The care of liver transplant recipients is based on limited evidence. So we have retrospective studies, observational studies, but really everyone does a bit of their own thing. Um, they're trying to do, you know, we are, we're all trying to do our best for patients, but the reality is that a lot of what we do is not, you know, clearly evidence-based uh, because uh, you know, we don't have uh, multi-center studies in uh, the transplant world. So um, certainly this is something that needs to be done. But uh, at this point, you know, there's very limited sort of evidence guiding our day-to-day -day management of patients. Additionally, uh, there's been a reluctance to perform liver biopsies in the long term in patients so that uh, you can use this to guide individualized immunosuppression. So the reality is that many patients may have seemingly normal liver enzymes. So, so their ALT may be less than 20, uh, AST, ALT may be less than 20, but then when you actually do a protocol liver biopsy, you find that they have inflammation. So um, especially if they were transplanted for autoimmune liver disease. And then what we know is that for any given ongoing injury in liver transplant re recipients, you have accelerated fibrosis or accelerated scarring. And I'll show you uh, a bit of that in the next uh, section of my talk. So overall, I think there's a lot of work we need to do uh, to improve long-term outcomes. In fact, this paper published in Annals of Surgery in 2019 showed that long-term survival beyond a year post-transplant has not improved in the last 30 years. So if you look at one year survival, it's improved from 65% to 95% one year survival. But if you look at long-term survival beyond a year, it has not significantly improved. So you can see that here. So from 1987 to 2016, these uh, authors actually looked at uh, survival beyond a year. And clearly there's been no improvement. So we need to find ways to turn transplant into a cure and allow our patients to enjoy the full benefit, especially because uh, it's such a precious resource. Uh, liver transplant is such a precious resource. A lot of work has been invested, resource has been invested here. So we want to help our patients uh, make the most of their transplant. So uh, this was the inspiration for this work. Our idea was to develop a more personalized risk calculator for managing long-term transplant care. We evaluated various deep machine learning algorithms to predict mortality uh, post-transplant, post incorporated longitudinal data over time, and classified patients into major risk categories. So um, we use the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients in the US, so over 42,000 eligible liver transplant recipients with longitudinal data available. Um, and then we tested on uh, our data set uh, at the University Health Network uh, to determine the uh, external validation of our algorithm. Uh, we considered annual follow-ups, uh, 267 clinical variables were used, and we looked at survival, and then survival compromised by graft failure, infection, cardiac event, and cancer, and then looked at one and five year outlook. So what this means is, say for example, you see a patient in your clinic at three years post-transplant, you can then predict their one and five year survival from that time point um, based on this algorithm's output. So the best performing model in this, uh, in our experiment in the end was the transformer model. So this is a heavy duty deep machine learning model that is able to integrate the complexity of longitudinal data 
over time, the patterns and interrelationships in the different variables. And uh, so this had uh, an overall area under the curve ranging from uh, 0 0.80 to 0 0.81 for uh, the different uh, types of complications uh, post-transplant. And then for overall survival, 0 0.77 was the AUC at one year. And then five-year AUC was 0.71, and uh, cardiac, graft failure, cancer, and infection-associated uh, mortality were predicted with an AUC ranging from 0.72 to 0.76. So this was in comparison to logistic regression with an AUC of 0.71 and 0.648, one in five years. We then did um, external validation with uh, our UHN data set, and similar performance was obtained. So this was very reassuring because Certainly many people have brought up, you know, with these large registries, uh, sometimes you have concerns uh, about uh, how accurate the data is. Now, the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients is extensively used for research, um, but uh, the very reassuring thing was that we obtained similar performance with our more granular data set at uh, UHN. And then what we did was, again, Shapley analysis to determine what were the top features, what were the top modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors that accounted for these predictions. And so uh, they were different for the overall population in the SRTR, the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients, and for UHN. So there were, you know, for the overall population, these differed. But what we can do now is then obtain for each individual patient coming forward, we can then obtain updated one and five year probability of each outcome at every follow up. What are the ranked features? So what are the modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors? So modifiable means, say for example, a tacrolimus trough level of a certain degree. You know, you could then consider, okay, so this patient, you know, my patient has a higher risk of cardiovascular uh, disease and associated mortality. So if you know, the presence of serolimus or uh, tacrolimus is an important factor that is contributing. You look at the weight of that factor in that prediction for that given patient, then you can say, okay, well, maybe we need to consider if it is possible, if our liver transplant, if the graft will allow us, maybe we should try to reduce the immunosuppression uh, and see if that would, um, you know, optimize their trajectory after transplant. Additionally, you can empower your patient in their care. So, you know, what often happens is you see your patient, uh, you know, at three years post-transplant, and then you say, you, you know, we'll tell them, okay, well, you have, uh, you know, your body mass index has increased over time. Now you've developed diabetes. Um, you do have a higher risk of cardiovascular event. You know, we need to pay special attention to that. But for our patients, it's not tangible. You know, you just give them this information. You don't have something tangible, like this is your percentage risk, you know. So uh, then often what happens is people will leave and then they'll come back the next year and unfortunately they may have gained more weight or they may have had worsening of their diabetes because it doesn't hit home that actually, you know, this is a an important problem and it is going to severely compromise their long-term survival. So it doesn't really uh, strike them. So if you can give them solid information that will empower them in their care. So now they know, okay, I need to take care of this. You know, I need to do this homework for next time. You know, so if you can engage your patient in their care, I think working together with your patient is very helpful ultimately to improving their survival and, you know, feeling that they have some control over uh, their health. I think is very important emotionally and psychologically. So, um, so now actually we are tying in uh, these predictions to our standard operating procedures for post-transplant care based on risk. And we actually have a, a dashboard. Uh, I haven't shown the exact dashboard that we have, but it is deploying from our electronic medical record system, which is called EPIC. And so it's deploying from there. Uh, I work very closely with a data engineering team, a data scientist who is actually guiding this deployment. And what this means is data is uh, extracted from Epic, uh, transferred to a cloud, and then from the cloud it is fed into the dashboard to provide personalized predictions for uh, the patient. Uh, and then so you can give them, you know, this is, these are my concerns in terms of uh, your long-term outlook, and these are the factors that are playing a role in this prediction. So what can we do? How can we work together to improve your long-term health?
<clears throat> so these are, you know, predictions that we can provide to patients, and actually we're deploying this now into the clinical setting. We're interested in evaluating in the long term uh, what this means for uh, at least you know, short-term outcomes, so uh, including, say, readmission to hospital, uh, any events uh, such as cardiovascular events, infection, etc. So we're wanting to look at, you know, the whole holistic care of our patient and whether this algorithm uh, can serve them and help, uh, you know, optimize their health. Um, the second, uh, um, you know, um, uh, project I'd like to talk about, uh, sorry, third project <laughs> I'd like to talk about now is uh, graft survival, so optimizing post-transplant graft survival. So um, so you're all aware that cir cirrhosis develops over decades, right? So, But in liver transplant recipients, for any given degree of injury, there is an accelerated rate of fibrosis. So um, in the hepatitis C era, we actually knew that with recurrent hepatitis C after transplant, there was an accelerated fibrosis progression of 0.4 stages per year. So patients would develop cirrhosis, say, by 5 to 10 years after the transplant, which was, you know, really tragic, actually. So this was at a time when hepatitis C was not curable. Now, obviously, the, the whole scenario has changed. But the reality is that for any given degree of injury, we actually know that there is accelerated rate of fibrosis. Mechanistically speaking, I mean, I'm very interested in understanding why that is. I suspect that there are a few different factors at play, and in fact, we identified that in this uh, study, but I think we also need to do some, you know, more mechanistic uh, investigations into this uh, by analyzing patient samples, but I suspect that some of it is donor age and then a decreased ability to regenerate and heal with any ongoing injury. So there are going to be different factors that will account for this accelerated rate of fibrosis. But this then means that we need to act uh, early to prevent this progression to cirrhosis. So what are the diagnostic options for fibrosis? I mean, you're well aware of, uh, you know, liver biopsy and then MR elastography. So these are all methods that will allow us to uh, identify the presence of fibrosis, um, both invasively and non-invasively. Um, so, the, you know, overall, uh, I think understanding a person's trajectory in terms of fibrosis, I think, will be very important to ensure that they can optimize the health of their graft in the long term. So, um, uh, as I start talking about that project, I should also mention we had this other paper which was published also in Lancet Digital Health in 2022, uh, which was for the effective de detection of advanced hepatic fibrosis. And so uh, here, uh, this was driven by Soren Sarvestani, who is an undergraduate student and with co-principal uh, uh, investigator Anna Goldenberg. Uh, so we looked at various parameters, clinical par parameters um, uh, in patients at the Toronto Center for Liver Disease. So this was in close collaboration with my colleague Kaur Patel and uh, Jada Sebastiani at McGill. And so um, uh, Soren then trained different uh, supervised machine learning algorithms. So supervised machine learning algorithms basically give you a binary outcome. So yes or no. So advanced fibrosis or no uh, fibrosis or minimal fibrosis. So um, he then uh, brought together all of these supervised ML algorithms, taking the advantages and disadvantages uh, of uh, these ML algorithms to then predict the presence of advanced fibrosis versus no. So I mention this because I think most people here are, uh, you know, uh, going to be interested in, say, um, diagnosis or detection of advanced hepatic fibrosis in chronic liver disease. But then this served as the inspiration for some other work that we did, uh, which I'll get into. Um, so here, the um, ensemble algorithm, which was, as I said, a combination of the, diff the different supervised ML algorithms, uh, had a very good sensitivity of 85.5%, and uh, the area under the rock curve was 87, uh, AUPRC, so precision rock curve was 87.8. 
Um, so then we looked at uh, a deep learning framework for the dynamic diagnosis of graft fibrosis ever after liver transplantation using longitudinal data. So uh, this was driven by uh, Amir, a uh, clinical research fellow, as well as uh, Divya Sharma, who is a postdoctoral computer science uh, um, uh, fellow, uh, who did her PhD actually at uh, IIT uh, in uh, Jaipur. Uh, so this was uh, with co- um, uh, co-senior author Wei Zhu. And so uh, Divya developed a deep machine learning model, a new model, actually, uh, which she called weighted long short-term memory network. So there is a, a standard deep machine learning algorithm called long short-term memory network, which she actually refined uh, into a new method, uh, considering the nuances of our data set. So she considered longitudinal, demographic, clinical, and laboratory test variables to detect significant fibrosis, fibrosis stage two or greater, um, comparing uh, this to reference method of liver biopsy. So a total of 29 variables were considered. So you can see uh, all of these here. And we considered the longitudinal changes in these variables over time prior to the biopsy. Um, so these were, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we compared uh, the performance of the algorithm to APRI and FEB4. Uh, we considered uh, 1,893 liver biopsies, um, of which uh, 1744 liver biopsies were in the uh, training set, um, and then uh, 149 in the validation set. Uh, this was divided, the 1744 number was divided into 70% training and 30% test set. And then uh, we also compared the performance to transient elastography. So she trained conventional machine learning algorithms, including all of these, uh, so more binary uh, uh, outcome predictors, so supervised ML. And then she also trained deep machine learning algorithms on the longitudinal data for prediction of uh, advanced fibrosis in the graft. And then she uh, determined that actually it would be optimal to add uh, a certain feature to this algorithm in order to optimize its performance. And so this weighted long short-term memory network method is better able to handle missing data, and it improves the LSTM performance through a certain weight loss function to minimize bias. So basically she upweighted the cases in comparison to the controls, because the cases were um, lower, significantly lower in comparison to the controls, so uh, the presence of advanced fibrosis. So this allowed uh, better training on the cases and optimized performance of the algorithm. And so uh, this also was published in Lancet Digital Health, uh, which uh, you know <laughs> became my favorite journal, I think, uh, so with three publications in that same journal. Uh, so uh, with this uh, algorithm, we had an AUC of 0.798 uh, and 100% uh, determinants. Sensitivity was 0.79, specificity 0.81. Uh, and this was in comparison to FIB4 and APRI with AUC of 0.65 and 0.68, uh, respectively. And then if we looked at the top ranked features for the overall population, recipient age was topmost transplant primary indication, donor age, and then various other parameters uh, further down. So this is for the overall cohort, but then for any new patient stepping forward, you could then provide a prediction as to whether you know someone is uh, likely to have advanced fibrosis, and then why is it that that patient is suspected to have advanced fibrosis? Um, now we're actually looking at predicting rate of fibrosis pro uh, progression. So there is a new uh, project now ongoing, and this will allow us, I think, to better uh, project forward. You know, so maybe in a certain patient, you need to be doing more regular liver biopsies to then ensure that they're on the optimal immunosuppression regimen, or maybe they need to be on a GLP-1 receptor agonist for MASH, or uh, you know, some other reason for ongoing injury, biliary uh, issues, et cetera. Okay, uh, next, uh, I think what I'll do is conclude with uh, an interesting new project that we have, and uh, this is now in submission. So if we look at uh, patients uh, post-transplant, certainly over 50% will have increased liver enzymes at some point in their liver transplant life, in their second life. And so these uh, reasons for liver enzyme elevation are varied. Normally we will do an ultrasound with Dopplers followed by uh, liver biopsy as gold standard for diagnosis. But this is invasive. 
And so it's not realistic to do liver biopsies longitudinally. And so uh, we've been looking at developing uh, different methods to be able to non-invasively diagnose. So uh, one method is uh, this graft IQ model, which uh, Divya Sharma, uh, again, has developed for rapid determination of diagnosis. So this is trained on clinical and laboratory data to identify graft uh, pathology. Um, and uh, we also are looking at circulating DNA methylation patterns on circulating D DNA to further refine. But uh, what she has done as a first step is trained on over 7,000 liver graft biopsies, uh, looking at longitudinal features over the week preceding biopsy, and patients were divided based on histological diagnosis. So the best performing uh, algorithm here was a neural network model, ANN, artificial neural network, with an AUC of 0.866. And uh, there were different performances, obviously, based on the different reasons for liver graft injury, so acute cellular rejection, alloimmune hepatitis, et cetera. And then uh, so sensitivity and specificity are listed here uh, with the AUC. Best AUC was uh, for biliary complications, all alloimmune hepatitis. And so uh, we then determined what were the top 10 features for each of these diagnostic categories. So. Um, you know, the nice thing about SHAP analysis, I should say, is that it provides the clinician with trust in the prediction. Because, you know, the problem with uh, machine learning algorithms traditionally has been that you have black box uh, predictions. And so this is not very helpful, and it doesn't give the, the physician or the patient trust in the prediction. So having Shapley analysis gives you this opportunity to say, oh, okay, well, this makes sense. You know, the top feature here was ALT, or the top feature here was ALP, and this actually makes sense. So uh, I'm more willing to trust uh, the output of this uh, machine learning algorithm. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so the next thing we did was uh, compare the machine learning model's prediction versus the average prediction accuracy by 12 hepatologists. So we did an exercise uh, in the month of December. We invited people, uh, you know, to uh, look at patterns in the data and then say, okay, well, what do you think is the more likely diagnosis here for this given patient? And so 30 cases were chosen for this implementation analysis. And as you can see, uh, you know, this was the medic versus machine learning <laughs> hepatologists, and we had seven hepatology fellows. But nonetheless, I would say even looking Looking at the expert hepatologist's uh, diagnosis, we were not as good as the machine learning model. And in fact, now what we did further, so we then taught the machine learning model. So then I told Divya, okay, so these are my six clinical rules in my head, you know. So for example, if someone has acute cellular rejection, then most often, they have ALT greater than AST. They also have elevated alkaline phosphatase. They will tend to be within the first year post-transplant. And then I gave her some other rules, so about six clinical rules. And then she uh, encoded this as prior knowledge. And then using some Bayesian inference principles, she applied this to fuse the prior knowledge uh, uh, provided by clinicians with the likelihood computed by the neural network. And then the integration uh, she achieved uh, was through a weighted combination of the probabilities generated by the machine learning model and the clinician. And there was this iterative feedback loop that then empowers the ML model to continuously learn, resulting in more precise predictions. And so in the end, actually, uh, you know, with uh, the addition of my six clinical rules, uh, we actually got even better performance, so an AUC integrating the clinical A insight, uh, the AUCs increased uh, significantly, so um, therefore outperforming the hepatologists even further. So I think over time, you know, if you continue to train the model with a larger number of cases, I think we will end up seeing even better performance over time. Now, uh, the final thing I will discuss is fine-tuning predictions with molecular data. And so, um, you know, circulating DNA or ALT basically just tells us that there is graft injury, but not the cause. And so I was very interested um, in looking at methylation patterns on circulating DNA because there was a colleague, close collaborator of mine, who had developed a new assay called CF Medip Seek that leverages just one milliliter of plasma. And uh, uh, what you can do with that plasma is basically expand it, uh, expand the DNA, uh, and then look at methylation patterns that are distinctive. So he published this paper in Nature in 2018 
where uh, he was able to uh, use methylation patterns on circulating DNA to distinguish different types of cancer uh, for screening for different types of cancer. So he looked at a large number of samples. And so I thought it would be very interesting given that we you know, often we, we don't know what's going on truly in the liver. So I was interested in seeing whether we could have some sort of molecular biomarker uh, that could tell us what was going on in the liver. So, you know, in the, in the just prior project, basically we can have rapid diagnosis, but I was interested in looking at, you know, methylation patterns and more mechanistic, uh, the mechanistic side of things. So we started off with this pilot study um, that was supported by the, the Canadian Society of Transplantation and also the American Society of Transplantation. And we looked at uh, 11 re liver transplant recipients who had recurrent NASH uh, post-transplant. We looked at the differentially methylated regions on their circulating DNA. So a number of uh, regions were hi hyper and hypomethylated in the promoter region and in the body, et cetera. So there were different, uh, I won't get into the details of this, but in the end, the DMRs or the differentially methylated regions in those patients who had uh, NASH post-transplant uh, had uh, DMRs in those genes involved in lipid metabolism or li and particularly lipolysis function. So this was very interesting and, you know, again, gives you some trust in um, uh, what we found. And then in uh, those patients who had acute cellular rejection, so there were 19 of them, uh, again, we found a bunch of DMRs that were hyper and hypomethylated, and uh, we identified platelet-derived growth factor pathway as well as some other inflammatory pathways that were uh, particularly um, dysregulated in those patients with uh, acute cellular rejection. Then uh, a postdoctoral fellow in my lab who uh, is, you know, very skilled at bringing together clinical data and omics data, then brought everything together. So uh, those 43 patients, basically she brought together the top 300 DMRs along with eight clinical variables. So um, age, sex, diabetes status, ALT, AST, ALP, uh, were uh, among the eight variables that we considered, and uh, she divided this uh, data set into training and test set, and uh, she was able to then classify uh, these patients into the correct diagnostic category. So here you can see a principal component analysis, and then uh, how, uh, you know, the uh, different populations are divided based on uh, the differentially methylated regions, so there's a clear distinction among the three uh, categories of patients. And uh, our machine learning algorithm, which integrated uh, all of those data, she developed this um, logistic regression uh, model with L2 regularization, integrating all of those data in these patients, and uh, was able to diagnose uh, acute cellular rejection with 95% accuracy and uh, MASH post-transplant with 82% accuracy. And uh, then she used SHAP analysis to determine what was the reason for these predictions in um, the overall population. And so very interestingly, uh, and this again, you know, was um, impressive to me because it gave me the trust in the prediction. Now, alkaline phosphatase uh, was an important reason for which, uh, you know, these patients with T-cell mediated rejection or acute cellular rejection were categorized as such. So as I mentioned, uh, patients with acute cellular rejection will, ha will have an elevated ALT versus AST and an elevated alkaline phosphatase. But patients with MASH post-transplant will not have elevated alkaline phosphatase. So that was the key distinguishing factor, number one. Then we had a bunch of differentially methylated regions and then some other clinical parameters. But uh, what I liked was that this, you know, was clinically meaningful. So it gave me trust in the prediction of this algorithm. And so we are uh, actually now expanding this uh, uh, study. Uh, we're performing external validation on a large number of samples uh, from Hanover, uh, from our uh, close collaborators there. So overall, I think uh, I'll conclude now. Um, uh, I, I believe that um, tools of artificial intelligence hold uh, great promise to personalize the care of liver transplant patients, liver patients. Uh, it's based on interrelationships and hidden patterns in complex data. There's so much data that we generate uh, that our patients generate on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Uh, deep machine learning algorithms are most helpful when we consider historical and longitudinal data in informing prediction of the future. Uh, and then finally, I think the next frontier is really clinical deployment and external validation of these algorithms to ensure that uh, they can have benefit not just at one institution, but really can be of broader benefit. And there, there's going to be a lot of, say, looking at fine-tuning a model for a given environment and making sure that, you know, it is going to be useful for patients across the world, worldwide, uh, regardless of their environment. So. Um, I'd like to conclude by acknowledging my key collaborators in uh, computer science, uh, members of the Transplant AI Initiative, my translational research team, and co-supervised computer science uh, trainees and clinical trainees. And these are uh, my group's uh, funding sources, including the CIHR and uh, other funding sources. So thanks so much for your attention, and uh, happy to take questions. Very nice and very educative, Mamta. And uh, thank you and welcome again to ILBS. Any questions or comments, uh, please? Uh, hi, Mamta. That was amazing work which you just showed us. Thank you. That, uh, I just had a few questions. One you already said is the need of external validation, whether the algorithms are performing the same way in other centers. And the second thing mm -hmm. is, have you started using in your clinical practice the algorithms which you developed at your center? And do you see that they perform well uh, against uh, mm -hmm. biology or so your thing? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, those are both excellent questions. Thank you. So I think um, one thing again to keep in mind, as I mentioned, you know, uh, many people have used off-the-shelf machine learning tools in their projects, uh, and uh, they may uh, train that algorithm on their data set and performs very well. But then when they try to externally validate, it doesn't work. And this is often what is happening in the machine learning world. Uh, but the reality is that, um, I mean, this is based on my own experience. Of course, this is my own perspective. Different people will have different perspectives. But um, I think that, uh, you know, work like this requires very close collaboration with computer scientists who know what they're doing, so who are academics because academics will be very interested in developing new methods as opposed to just working with off-the-shelf methods. So sometimes, you know, biostatisticians will, uh, you know, try to develop ML algorithms or they will train established algorithms. But I think the reality is that our data is very com complex. I mean, re regardless of the medical field, I think there's so, so much complexity in the data. And in order to really reflect that complexity, I think we need to develop methods that are best suited for the clinical nuances of the question. So uh, the reason for, you know, a lack of external validation for some of these studies, I think, is because people have not made that effort to really develop a model that is best suited for the clinical nuances of the question. The second thing is, I think it is wrong to conclude that if, you know, a tool does not validate in the external uh, validation data set, that, you know, uh, machine learning is useless. That's not a good conclusion to make. You know, the, the conclusion should be that, like, I need to seek, I need to understand why is it that that model is not working and understand what are the environmental factors that are leading to that decreased performance. And then what can we do to improve its performance in that given context? So I acknowledge that, you know, whatever I've trained at UHN, will not perform the same way at ILBS or at uh, Mayo Clinic or some other, you know, program. <coughs> because every center will have its own nuances. And then, again, another issue is that every physician may have their own practices. So there's so much complexity in uh, the data, and we, we will be limited, uh, you know, um, in terms of identifying what are the factors that are contributing to decreased performance, because there are going to be some of these, you know, sort of nuances, uh, people practicing a bit differently, uh, we, even within an institution. 
Uh, say, for example, a surgeon uh, may uh, take a liver offer, but then another surgeon may not take that liver offer because of their own personal experience. Maybe the last case they did, you know, adversely impacted their judgment on this new offer. You know, maybe they feel like this is not a good organ offer as compared to their colleague who is willing to accept that offer. So there are going to be some of these things that, you know, we can't really feed into the algorithm. So that's that's one issue. And then uh, I think, what was the the second question? Oh, uh, am I actually, oh, are we yeah, deploying the tools, right? At your center oh, and yeah, see yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we are actually deploying uh, the first uh, Lancet Digital Health paper. So that's what I was talking about. We have a dashboard that takes the data from uh, EPIC, which is our electronic medical record system. It goes to a cloud, and then it feeds into the dashboard to provide personalized predictions for uh, a given patient. So we are testing this prospectively in a silent trial, um, but I have yet to determine its, uh, you know, performance because it's still an ongoing process. We just started this, you know, within the last two months. So still a work in progress, but I think, you know, in, in the liver transplant world or in the liver world, actually we are doing something uh, unique, I think, because uh, so far people have been working on developing algorithms, but not actually deploying in real time and understanding the practical realities of deployment in hepatology. So I think this will be an interesting learning experience for us, as well as the liver community. I have a question here, Dr. Bamda. Regarding your uh, concordance data that you showed about the pre-transplant evaluation, so were you looking at the weightless mortality, the first uh, part, and the second part you were looking at the protected group that you said women and the PBC group. Yeah. So like, like how much change could you bring about with your model in the uh, weightless mortality? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, when we simulated... So first of all, we were looking at waitlist mortality or dropout off the waitlist. So becoming too sick for a transplant and dropping off the waitlist. So we looked at both of them as uh, a single outcome, com composite outcome. So um, uh, in terms of, um, I think, you know, uh, waitlist mortality or dropout, uh, again, uh, this will uh, be dependent also on the local supply of organs. Um, now, if you simulate the performance of our model in different regions where there is more access to organs versus less access to organs, I'm sure we will find differential performance, which is actually what we have found. So we did look at the performance of our algorithm across the different U.S. Uh, donor regions, and actually there is a bit of a differential performance uh, based on, you know, how much uh, uh, supply there is in relation to demand. Yeah, was that your question, or yeah, well, that's this question because that is what I've seen in terms of MEL3 that you had mentioned. Yeah. But w w what was the change from MEL3 to your model of Dynama? You you said Dyn. So Dynama. waitlist mortality. I, I think the other thing uh, what we have found we have used LiveSim, which is a liver simulation liver uh, allocation model. Uh, which allows us to roughly predict uh, how well our algorithm would serve in terms of reducing waitlist mortality. And we did find, I, I didn't show that data because uh, that experiment is still a bit in progress. So, but uh, we, we did find that actually our uh, algorithm would be projected to decrease waitlist mortality. You can also consider that some patients who are now what we call over advantage are going to be reclassified into a lower category. So we have to also be very careful not to, you know, unduly uh, disadvantage, uh, you know, people who are now we consider over advantage. But so far we have seen, at least in our simulation, that uh, such people, you know, could wait for a longer time uh, for an organ as compared to those patients who are currently disadvantaged. So what was the reason yeah, to take I off think, the exception uh, points? Sorry. Mamta would be here for a full day today. She is visiting us, so Professor Mamta Bhatt is available for the day, and also maybe on the 7th of, uh, mm -hmm. so she'll be here. A big round of applause to her. Thank you. Thank you, Mamta. In the interest of time, we'll move on. Okay, and, uh, good. Uh, many more questions, including from me, but I think <laughs> I have to conclude. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for your attention and interest.